I sat up in the patient bed. Dr. Lawrence had just finished another scan on my head and was analyzing the results. I'd been poked and prodded for at least a day, everything about my body being examined. The doctor had closed down the building to provide cover for these activities. I think, in some ways, he was also trying to give his staff some deniability when this whole operation comes tumbling down. He likely knew this was the last experiment. Everything looks good, he said, almost as if he was talking to himself. I'm still shocked you were able to escape. All of your vitals, brain activity, everything about you seems perfectly healthy. Nothing out of the ordinary. I listened, not really sure what he was expecting to find. What does that mean? I asked. Well, it means I can't tell anything substantive from these tests that somehow makes you different, or that you were affected at all by the still world, he said. Why did you select me to begin with? What about me was different from my initial interview? I asked. He stopped there and looked up from the readouts from the scans. He considered me for a moment, then sat on a stool nearby. The test you took was about perseverance, how you handle adversity, a test of your will to keep going on in life despite setbacks. In our earlier tests, we weren't sending people into the still world to the level you are. They were truly just taking a look around with mild sedation. But we found that people with a low degree of self-esteem, willpower, or a drive in life would get sucked deeper into the world. Some of the earliest test subjects you saw in the storage room are examples of this, he explained. What I'm theorizing is that it was your pure inner drive that got you out. It's also what's going to give you an advantage going back in because I think I can send you in with something. With something? I asked. A cure, if you will, he said. I want to send you in with a syringe to counteract the cocktail we've given to some of the subjects. If it works, it will give us hope for the rest. You might have noticed you still had your clothing on you when you went in the first time. I think that's because you don't really think about it. Your clothes are just inherent, a part of you after you put them on. You don't really think about them. I'm hoping we can give you some additional items and have them pass through with you as well. All of this seemed way too theoretical, a word he kept saying about this plan. Trusting me and everyone in that storage room's life to a theory is what got all of us in this mess in the first place. Two doses, one for Maggie, if you can find her, then the other for you. If you get in trouble, use your syringe immediately. You're the only person who knows how to get in and out so if we lose you, that's it, he said. His tone had a sense of concluding, like he had finished formulating his plan and was ready to proceed. A feeling of apprehension creeped over me. I wasn't sure I was ready to go back, to sneak past the hunters, to head down the cave. Are you ready to begin? he asked. Yes, let's get started, I said. Dr. Lawrence pressed a button to make the patient bed move to a laying position. He put in the IV line and affixed the appropriate bags to the rack. Before he pushed the tranquilizer cocktail, he came over to me and put two syringes in my hand. For the cure, he said. Then he moved to the other side of the bed and in my left hand, he placed two coins. I looked at them in the palm of my hand quizzically, then back to the doctor. Just. What you told me sounded like a familiar story. If I'm right, you'll need those. Just stick them in your pocket when you get in, he said. He moved to the rack with IV bags and reached for the lines. He put a syringe into a port and pushed the tranquilizer cocktail into the line. As it flowed into my veins, the darkness started to come. My eyes drooped, and I slowly felt myself drift away. I opened my eyes and was standing on a platform. Ahead of me was the door I passed through to return to my world. I felt compelled to go forward, put my hand on the doorknob and open it. As I did so, the circular cave room of doors flooded with the colorful light. After I passed the door frame, the door shut behind me. As it did, the color from the real world faded to gray, signaling that I had truly returned to the nightmare. There was no sign of Maggie. If she was taken by the hunter, there was no obvious trail, blood, or anything disturbed at all. I looked down at my hands, and incredibly the syringes and coins were still there. I put both in my pockets for safekeeping, turning to the door I came through. 
and pressed my hand against it. The warmth that I remembered from the last time I was here was absent. It sent a cold shiver through my body at the touch. Apparently, this exit was not going to be available for me again. I found the hole that served as the entrance for this room. I managed to climb back up through to the main cavern, checking both directions to make sure a hunter wasn't in the immediate vicinity. I stepped into the main pathway. Being right next to the entrance to the next chamber, I again looked in to see what was previously people pushing boulders into one another. Now, they all seemed to be standing still, staring at me. Their boulders forgotten. They were keenly interested in me and nothing else. I stepped into the chamber, no looking back now. As I proceeded through to the other side, their gaze followed me as I passed each person. Their eyes seemed faded, gray, as if being in this place for so long had fundamentally changed them. None of them spoke, just stared as I passed through the chamber to the next tunnel. I didn't look back to see if they were still looking. As I passed out of sight, I again heard the booming sounds of the rocks being pushed throughout the room. They had returned to their eternal struggle that I witnessed before. The passage continued further into the earth. As it widened, I took in an extremely large chamber, larger than anything I had encountered so far. A flowing river covered most of the area of this place. Only this river was unlike anything I had ever seen. It was a deep red color, almost like blood. As I passed through the entryway to this place, I saw a single figure standing next to a boat at the edge of the river. They stood leaning on a paddle, and as I approached, extended their arm toward me. Their fist opened to offer a withered looking hand. I considered them for a moment, wondering what this could mean. Then I remembered what the doctor said about the coins. What you told me sounded like a familiar story. If I'm right, you'll need those. I reached into my pocket and retrieved the two coins he had given me. I placed them into the withered, outstretched hand of the figure with a the paddle. They closed the coins in their grip and placed them in a pocket of their long, dark cloak. He, it, whatever it was, motioned for me to get onto the boat. The boat creaked as the old timber strained under the additional weight. The ferryman pushed the boat into the river and jumped in. We rode the current further down the river, the ferryman guiding our movement with his paddle from the rear. The river itself was calm as we rode it, a light current pushing us onward. As we continued on, however, I noticed the waters ahead becoming choppier. I sat forward, trying to get a better view as we entered these waters. It became clear that the choppier waters were not due to rocks or a stronger current, but from the people who were in the water. There were hundreds of them all around us, punching, kicking, attempting to shove one another under the surface. A never-ending battle between these people was raging in the red waters, splashing all around us. The ferryman seemed completely unfazed by this horrific sight and continued to press us forward to the next pier. As we approached, the boat slowed and the ferryman motioned to get off the boat. As I did, he turned and began paddling back upriver abandoning me here with no way to return but through the waters of anger filled with violent souls. Another entryway and cave passage behind me continued down into the depths of this madness. I turned from the river and pressed forward, determined to find Maggie and escape from this nightmare. Unlike the others, this passageway was short and opened into another large chamber. It was still and silent. No other people seemed present. The room itself was shaped like a pyramid, with a single source of light in the ceiling. This wasn't like sunlight. It was eerie and dimmer, like a muted moonlight that just barely gave life to the room. The room itself was filled with what looked like stone slabs that lay silent on the ground, placed randomly throughout. Though they were seemingly innocuous, I felt a sense of dread as I approached these slabs. I kept as far a distance as possible from them as I made my way through the center of the room. The dim light of the room betrayed me, however. I tripped over one of the slabs that I didn't see right away, and I tumbled on the ground beside it. I rolled over, rubbing my knee where I took most of the impact. My heart froze as the slab I tripped over began to move, 
slowly opening to reveal a hole in the ground that it was covering. Once revealed, flames burst through the ground where the slab had been covering. An arm shot out of the tomb, blistered and burned, trying to reach for me, pull me beneath the slab to join it. I jerked backward and narrowly evaded its grasp. I yelled as I got up and ran to the other end of the chamber. As I reached the exit, I looked back to see the slab slowly covering the tomb once again, perhaps to await its next victim. I shuddered to think what would have happened had I been snared by that hand. I turned and exited the chamber, trying to put the thought behind me. The cave passageway was now beginning to heat up. Up until this point, most of the room seemed to have a comfortable temperature and atmosphere. Down this tunnel, however, it began to warm significantly. Steamy and humid air began to fill my lungs as I traveled further down. The next chamber entrance appeared around a corner, and I stood for a moment to take in the sheer size of the room I was entering. Unlike anything I had encountered before, there was an enormous open area that was home to several different contraptions. The river I had crossed seemed to flow into this room. Deep red water was traveling through a circular stone aqueduct that was constructed around the outer edges of the room. Giant bonfires were lit below the stone and were superheating the water. Steam plumed off the red liquid as it moved through the ring. From where I was standing, the long stairway led down to the center of the room. It safely crossed over top of the aqueduct, leading to a small island in the lower center, which was surrounded by river water. There appeared to be several trees growing on this island. On the other side, the stairway led up again and onward to other sections of the cave system. Continuing down the stairway, I was careful not to misstep because there were no guardrails, no way to stop yourself if you were to tumble. If you did, it would be straight down into the aqueduct or an extremely high fall. As I moved closer to the aqueduct, I was horrified to see that there were bodies in the water, some floating, others flailing in a vain attempt to remove themselves from the trap. The stone was carved so smooth, though, there was no way for them to grab onto anything and pull themselves out. I looked away, unable to continue to watch the horror these people were going through, focusing mainly on my path and the island that was at the end of it. Reaching the lower steps, I started to get a better view of the island itself. The ground was barren, apart from the trees. A hard-packed sand covered the small patch of land. The trees were strange, no leaves grew on them, and their limbs were shaped in extremely odd angles, like they were planted and the limbs themselves fought to keep from growing vertically. I approached one of them to get a better look, but jumped back in shock. In the center of the trunk of one of the larger trees was a human face, twisted in pain. The limbs themselves also looked to be like human arms and legs, grown out at strange angles like tree limbs. I shuddered at the sight and realization of this. I backed away, resolving myself to move around the outer edge of the small forest near the river water. As I did so, I approached a smaller tree away from the others. It was notably younger and had not sprouted nearly as many limbs. As it came into view, my heart jumped as I saw that the face in the center of the trunk still resembled a person and had not completely turned to hard bark. I stepped closer, cautious of everything in this place because everything so far had been hostile. The face came into view and I knew immediately I had found who I was looking for. Maggie was trapped here in the ground. The beginnings of the formation of the tree around her had already begun around her legs and up her body. Her eyes were closed, and she didn't see me approach. Maggie, it's me, it's Jim, I said quickly. Her eyes shot open at the sound of my voice. She didn't seem able to speak, but her eyes told a story of terror as she shook with fear at the sight of me. I have something. I think I can get you out of here, I explained. Her eyes shot upward and then back to me. Back and forth, they shot up and then back. She was trying to communicate something, but I didn't quite understand what. Then, above me, a sound of large wings beating against the air came overhead. 
I ducked down in front of Maggie as a large bird figure swooped down and landed on one of the trees in the center of the island. It was covered in feathers, but had a human-like visage, like that of an elderly woman, except its features were elongated to form a sharp beak. It shot its beak down sharply into nearby limbs and snapped them off with enormous force, making loud crunching noises. It feasted on several sections of tree before taking flight again. I watched as it did so, realizing that I was completely unaware as I traveled the stair. I was walking under what appeared to be giant nests built in the upper sections of this chamber. The bird monster flew up to one of them and out of sight. Turning back to Maggie, who was looking more terrified than before, I pulled out one of the two syringes I was carrying in my pocket. Removing the cap, I found a clean section of skin that had not yet been transformed and plunged the needle in, compressing the plunger, shooting home the serum Dr. Lawrence had created. The effect was immediate. Maggie's eyes drooped and she closed them. Her figure inside the tree seemed to recede on itself. Then her body quickly shrunk and vanished from sight, leaving an open husk of a tree where her body used to be. Terrifying shrieks from the large birds erupted throughout the chamber all around me. I looked up and saw dozens of large creatures take flight above me, apparently aware of the escape of one of their prisoners. I quickly dropped the used syringe and reached for the other one. Undoing the cap, I held it up to plunge into my own arm when one of the birds landed so close to me and so violently it shot me off my feet, syringe leading my hand. Landing on my back near the river's edge, I saw the syringe land a few feet away, rolling to a stop. The monster shrieked, its enormous beak opened wide to reveal a hidden row of razor-sharp teeth on the inside. I quickly rolled toward the syringe, only narrowly escaping the lunge of a beak where I had been laying. I grabbed the syringe and jammed the needle through my pants and into my leg, compressing the plunger. The monster didn't lunge again, it instead waited, watching me. The reason became clear as I was suddenly pulled from behind. I looked around and saw countless arms, hands, feet. People had emerged from the depths of the river and were pulling me into the water. As I fell backward, the bird shrieked again, only this time it sounded unmistakably like laughter. My body plunged into the water, dragged forcefully into the lower depths, struggling to free myself hopelessly against the grasp of a dozen lost souls. I felt my body tighten. My insides seemed to collapse into themselves, and I felt myself being ripped from the grasp of the damned and thrown a hundred miles into the air. I awoke suddenly in my patient bed back in the lab, gasping for breath. Dr. Lawrence was there, looking at me in shock and checking my vitals. Deep breaths, he said. I couldn't wait, though. I needed to know if it worked. Maggie, I gasped. Did she wake up? Dr. Lawrence nodded, but his expression was grim. He looked over to a second bed that had been set up nearby. Jim, she's back, but she's not like she was, he said. I got out of bed and ran to her side. She was in an upright position, eyes open but expressionless. I placed my hand on her arm. Eggie, it's me, Jim, you're back, I said. She remained expressionless, though, unable to comprehend what I said or that anyone was around her. What's wrong with her? I asked. Dr. Lawrence came over and looked at her as well. I'm not sure. I've never seen anything like this. Then again, the only person I've ever seen come out of that place was you. Maybe it's due to the amount of time she spent down there. Maybe it sapped something from her in this world, he speculated. I bowed my head, unable to accept that this had all been for nothing. We're... Were you able to find anyone else to rescue? He said awkwardly. I turned then and punched him square in the face. He fell backward, hands going for his nose where my fist hit him. No, I shouted. You have no idea what you've been doing here, where you've been sending people. There's no one left to save. She was the only one I could find that even had a chance. I moved to the corner of the room where a phone was located on the wall. What? What are you doing? He asked. Calling the police. This is over, I said. The police and investigators closed down the lab immediately. They took my story, but didn't take it seriously. At least, 
I didn't think I'd actually experienced a completely different world. My experience was chalked up to some psychedelic trip as a result of the medications I was given by Dr. Lawrence. The doctor was taken into custody and immediately jailed with no bail. After the judge saw the sheer number of his victims, it became clear that a catastrophic crime had been committed in the name of this experiment. As far as I know, he's in jail now, awaiting trial. The living subjects of the experiment that had been snared in the lower depths of the still world were kept confidential. Their families notified, and I was not given information about what happened with them. I assume that each family dealt with the loss of their loved ones in their own way. As for Maggie, she was taken to a psychiatric hospital where she is set to stay indefinitely. They could not figure out what had sent her into this state. With no one believing my story of what happened, I don't think there was any chance they would. I visit her often, sit next to her by the windows and look out at the sunshine, tell her about what's going on in life. I don't know if the visits help, and certainly the first time I visited, she was not responsive. My last visit, though, I held her hand as I spoke, and she turned her head to me. She didn't speak, but the faintest of smiles lit up her face. In that moment, I knew the answer. A single word that transcends the depths of any horrors that she experienced. Something I could give to her to bring her back to me. Love. I smiled back, and we both looked out at the rays of sunshine peeking through the tree leaves outside quietly sitting and taking in the beauty of the world.